30 seconds. Twenty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. In your face, all over the place. We're online 24-7, 24-7. You're listening to the hottest internet station. From beautiful Celine in southeastern Michigan. Around the world at sunskymysteries.com. This is the 2009 Top 10 Webcam in the World winner. This is SETV. Transmitted at the request of the United States Office of Civil Defense at 3.40 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, NORA detected a long-range nuclear missile launch in North Korea. This missile is believed to be headed in the direction of the Los Angeles metropolitan area. It is believed that it will impact this area within the next one and one half to two hours. All residents within a 400-mile radius of this area should seek a fallout shelter immediately. The only real effect I can have is to create the impression that things aren't as bad as they are. To give our people time, the opportunity to survive. I guess I just never realized I'd gone so far. We'd lost so much control. Totalitarianism doesn't need armies. It only needs to control a couple of things. The media and the ability to dispense privilege to some and withhold it from others. And of course, a weak and divided people helps. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and immane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. Petrodollars, electrodollars, multidollars, rank marks, rims, rubles, pounds, and shekels. It is the international system of currency which determines the totality of life on this planet. Well, good evening everybody, Bill Zam here. Let me make some last minute technical adjustments. There we go. How you guys doing tonight? Today is July 25th, 2012. My job is to wake people up, whether they like it or not by presenting um, news and information in such a manner as to attempt to make it entertaining and to provide you with information that you may or may not know about. Now, at our site, SeleneETV.com, we're going to show you a screen capture of the site here in a few minutes. We have... Um, installed our own encrypted chat server and anybody who's a member at the site is more than welcome to partake in using the chat server 
the uh, instructions are on the page at selenetv.com. On any page that you go to, the instructions link will be there. We have also um, installed a voice chat server. This is also encrypted. On this one, you cannot turn the encryption off. There's no way to do it. It's always going to be an encrypted connection. When you are talking to somebody on the voice chat, it is PC to PC with only the server software as a go-between. So, we have that up and running and we are going to be testing it. If you would like to test it, go to selenetv.com, click the contact us, and let us know that you'd like to help test the voice chat server. As you know, many of our guests have had issues with being kicked offline, had their um, VOIP uh, messed with, as well as um, other nefarious deeds that have been done while they have been on the show. And this voice chat is going to help us with our international, internationally based guests. Now, for the first story tonight, um, one of the hardest things with getting doing show prep. I mean, show prep is 24 hours a day. You basically live show prep when you're doing a show like this. It's just one of those things. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, I came across a story tonight, and I haven't been able to look real deeply into it, but I wanted to lead off the show with this particular uh, story. Let me uh, adjust the monitor uh, headphones here. Um, when, you, when you're doing a show, here's a little dirty secret of the uh, broadcast industry. Um, first of all, you can't see it on the camera, but I'm literally su surrounded by uh, computer screens. Honest to goodness, I'm surrounded by computer screens. Here, look, let me uh, move the camera here a little bit. There's a um, computer screen there. There's a computer screen there. There's uh, the laptop is down here, and now we have another laptop running. It's um, you know one of those things. You also have an audio monitor, as you know. We have a soundboard and everything else, and what you're saying is piped into your headphones, but it's like a millisecond behind. So you're basically listening to an echo of yourself, and it can get quite. Um, disconcerting sometimes. So, you have a ten, you, you like to have it turned down as far as possible, but still be able to hear yourself in the background to know that everything's still working right. There's not like some kind of hideous buzzing sound. At any rate, the first story tonight, let's go over to our monitor screen. There we go. Our first story tonight involves a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Solari Par, par uh, Vinci, Benjamin Solari Parvaninci. He uh, lived from 1898 to 1974, and he was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, on August 8th, obviously, of 1898. He was an artist, he was a professor, um, and uh, a bunch of other things. He was secretary of the Association for the Development Arts in 1948, and was also promoted several arts-related projects in Buena Aires. The interesting thing about him is that he was also um, like Edgar Cayce or Nostradamus. He was a uh, uh, prophetic kind of a guy. He would. Uh, I've seen a video of him. I don't have it to play on the show. I apologize for that. Um, he would like go into a trance and draw stuff and write things and stuff like that. Basically what I do on a day-to-day -day basis between the hours of 8 and 4. However, he wrote something in 1972. And let me bring the screen back up again and we'll take a look at that. Hopefully you can see this on the screen okay. In 1972, Para Vinci 
made a prophetic drawing while he was in a trance state. This uh, incidentally comes from our good friends at Godlike Productions. Uh, let's see. He made a prophetic drawing while he was in a trance state. The drawing and text it contains clearly refers to the London Olympics through the torch, the bell, which is the biggest bell in the world and will be used in the Olympic Stadium. He even drew the exact outlines of the London Olympic Park, the Tower of Ancelor Metal Orbit, and the text associated with his prophecies speaks about death, fire, explosion, war between the United States, Russia, and China, which confirms that this London Olympic false flag will also be used as a trigger for nuclear World War III. I'll believe that when I see it. This is the text, which was with the drawing of Pavavinci's on the London Olympics. Here is the text. For those of you listening on the audio side, those of you on the video side, theoretically you can see this. But since we also record this on MP3s, um, well, people have to know what I'm talking about. Fire, starvation, plagues, death are repeatedly de denounced by the righteous throughout the world. But the world do not listen. Then comes the darkness of the dragon, which seemed asleep. Comes the terror of the bear that pretended love and brotherhood. Comes the modest democracy that has never been, and comes with it the bottomless poverty, and with them all the explosions of disintegration comes the dark, and then the light of the South and the Cross. Published on June 22nd, uh, 2012. I thought that was uh, relatively interesting. Uh, everybody's... Um, yeah, everybody's uh, at least um, halfway interested in prophecies, that sort of thing. A lot of people read the Bible, uh, the Koran, other things that have prophecies in them. A lot of people watch the Notre Dame shows, otherwise they wouldn't be on the uh, TV. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, read Edgar Cayce, that sort of thing. A lot of people have very vivid nightmares. Um, so, anyways, that's what this guy wrote. Um, obviously, the, um, what does it say here, the, uh, the bear that pretended love and brotherhood comes with modest democracy that has never been. Obviously, that's Russia. And this was written in the mid-1970s before the fall of the Soviet Union. So, it's, you know, take it with a grain of salt if you'd like. That is up to you. Let's go back to our show notes so I can start my whining and crying for the evening because this is going to be good. Let's see, right here. When did we run this particular story here at the Celine Entertainment Television Network? Oh, yeah, it was April 28th. And thanks for finally noticing now that it's like three months later bunch of idiots. I can only be talking about the story that is making the rounds that Alexander Backman and I covered on April 28, 2012 for three hours. You can listen and watch that particular show right here by going to our website, selineetv.com, and going down here to the archives right here. SBI with Alexander Backman, the threat from within. I can only be talking, of course, about the latest um, brouhaha going on in Washington, D.C. This comes from our friends at WorldNet Daily. It is uh, entitled, Hillary's Chief Worked with Al-Qaeda Front Man. Yes, we are talking about the uh, infiltration of the United States government and the United States uh, as a whole by Al-Qaeda friendly organizations. <laughs> you notice how I did that? I didn't actually name any organizations, so you know, like nobody can come and firebomb the uh, studios here. <laughs> Al-Qaeda uh, related organizations. 
you can go ahead and figure that one out for yourself. I know you're smart enough to do that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be watching this show. This is by Aaron Klein, by the way. Hillary Clinton's chief of staff, Huma Abedin, worked on the editorial board of a Saudi-financed Islamic think tank alongside a Muslim extremist and accused of financing al-Qaeda fronts. The extremist, Abdullah Omar Nassif, is deeply connected with the Abedin family. Nesef, Nesif, whatever his name is, is Secretary, Secretary General of the Muslim World League, an Islamic charity known to have spawned terrorist groups, including one declared by the United States government to be an official Al-Qaeda front. Democrat and Republican lawmakers have rallied to Huma Abedin's defense since five GOP Congress members, led by Representative Michelle Bachman of Minnesota, sent letters last month to the Inspector Generals at the Departments of Homeland Security, Justice, and State asking that they investigate Muslim Brotherhood influence on the United States government officials. Of course, nothing's going to be done about it. Nothing was done about it back in April when we covered it and made the big splash that we did. Nothing was done in April when we had our show immediately, well, the day after Glenn Beck uh, aired his documentary, Rumors of War 3. Nothing happened then other than a bunch of hate mail and a bunch of other things. Mark my words, this stuff is true, and it certainly looks like it is. You people have really really screwed up. And this is, by the way, an open invitation to Representative Bachman to come on the show for three hours any night she would like to. If you happen to live in her district, if you happen to know her, know her office, anybody that works on her staff, tell her. Bill Zam will give her an open platform for three hours. We'll have Alexander Bachman on too. He's an expert on this subject. He had to go into hiding for two years for covering this subject because of the death threats. Got it? Good. Probably not, but what the hell? I got to try. So, um, if you really want to find out what's going on, um, listen to the archive of the show. And now, we're going to get to another story that I have actually been following for many many years. I think I actually saw this story first on In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, maybe the early 1980s. This is called the Metal Library. Um, we're going to go over here. This is uh, Philip Copen's site. You've uh, probably seen Philip on... Um, Various shows on the History Channel. I believe, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he's on uh, Ancient Aliens right now. Is one of the uh, commentators on that particular show. The Quest for the Metal Library, a system of tunnels and caves beneath beneath Ecuador and Peru, is reputed to hold an ancient treasure house of artifacts, including two libraries, one containing inscribed metal books and the other storing tablets of crystal. And this is by Philip Copens. And here is a uh, photograph from inside the caves. Let's see if we can zoom in on that for you. There you go, right there. It's not what you know, but who you know. In 1973, Eric von Daniken, at the height of his fame, following the success of Chariots of the Gods, claimed that he had entered into a gigantic subterranean tunnel system in Ecuador, which he was told spanned the length of the continent. Surely, evidence that our ancestors were highly advanced. The structure was believed to house a library in which books were made out of metal. This in an area where today is nothing but primitive Indian tribes with no written language. Is this evidence of a lost civilization? It was a major claim, and it did not go unchallenged. And let's see. That was, I believe, a quote from Neil Armstrong. 
the fellow that walked on the moon. The story centered around Janos, or Juan Morinzzz, an aristocratic Argentinian-Hungarian entrepreneur who claimed that he had discovered a series of tunnels in Ecuador that contained a metal library in a signed affidavit. Signed. Dated. 8 July 1969, he spoke about his meeting with the Ecuadorian president where he received a concession that allowed him total control over this discovery, provided he could produce photographic evidence and an independent witness that corroborated the discovery of the underground network. Newspapers reported on the expedition. In 1972, Morris met with Von Daniken and took him to a secret side entrance through which they could enter into a large hall within the labyrinth. Apparently, Von Daniken never got to see the library itself, just the tunnel system. The passages all form perfect right angles. Sometimes they are narrow, sometimes they are wide, the walls are smooth, and often seem to be polished. The ceilings are flat and at times look as if they were covered with a glaze. Blah, 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 blah. Um, however, one of the world's potentially biggest discoveries soon turned sour. Journalist from the German publications Der Spiegel and Stern interviewed Moritz who now denied ever having been in the cave with Von Daniken. It undermined Von Daniken's credibility, branding him a liar. For many, the incident, incident proved that Von Daniken was a fabricator of lies, a much more damaging assert, assert claim than, than being known to make outlandish claims that the gods were ancient astronauts. No one pointed out that if Von Daniken had been lying, he would not have left such an easy trail for Maurice to follow. So, that is the uh, basic primer, if you will, on this cave system and these um, golden books. There was also a, um, oh, let me see if I can find what I was, uh, nope, I don't have any notes on that. There was also a, um, a, a priest down there in Ecuador that had possession of many of these artifacts. If you, um, uh, Father Crispin, C-R, I believe it's spelled C-R-E-S-P-I-N, Father Crispin, something like that. If you look up Father Crispin Ecuador on Google, you'll find more information than you could possibly imagine. He had possession of a lot of these artifacts. Uh, a lot of them are made out of gold, tin, um, that sort of thing, metals, um, and, and nobody knew where he got them or anything like that. He was a uh, right friendly guy. Uh, there's many videos of uh, Father Crispin meeting with people and talking about the artifacts. Uh, he was sworn to secrecy that he would not uh, reveal the location of it, and it has essentially faded into history, and, um, well, you know, it became a fable. Oh, contraire. Our friends over at Soci Birdie, S O C Y B R B E R T Y dot com, have released this article Legendary Metal Library in Taos Cave Found. A team of explorers is claiming that they have found the legendary metal library and various other treasures and ancient objects in the Taos cave system in Ecuador in what may be one of the biggest discoveries ever. A team of explorers is claiming that they have found the legendary Golden Library, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened to the text, but uh, we'll just go ahead and highlight it so you can see it. Mysterious, uh, they have found the legendary Golden Library and other mysterious treasures in the Taos cave system in Ecuador. The team announced they accidentally found some hidden tunnels that were obviously dug out artificially sometime in the ancient past while inside one of the main chambers. The team was able to follow one of these tunnels for approximately half a mile and came upon a large room containing the Golden Library and various other treasures. Uh, let's see here. Below is a list of what the explorers have claimed to have found in the library. Here's a list a library with thousands of metal books. The team was unable to specify what metal the books were made of, but the look was similar to silver. 
Um, incidentally, as a uh, side point, silver does corrode. So if they're covered with corrosion, then they are silver. If they are not covered with corrosion, then they are not silver. As you all know, gold is the one metal that does not corrode or uh, get any damage to it. Each page had symbols and strange writing on them. Individual plates with writing on them and strange symbols that looked to be made of gold. At least several hundred statues of insects, animals, and humans spread throughout the large chamber. Lots of metal bars, thought to be both gold and or silver. Also found were various children's toys and jewelry items made from gold or silver. One large sarcophagus containing one human skeleton decorated with jewels and golden jewelry. The team also found at least three doors that could be more tombs but were sealed completely shut. As of right now, the team has only announced their findings on, on a radio show and no other announcements have been made, so the jury is still out as to whether their claims are completely true. The team did have samples of at least one of the metal books, one golden plate, and several small statues that they will be submitting for testing. So hopefully, we will get answers soon. The team would not reveal the location of this incredible finding, only saying that it is part of the Taos cave system. The explorers claim that they have concealed the location once again to make sure no one else locates the treasure until they get their samples tested. Once testing is complete, they agreed on the radio program to bring in a large professional team to fully ex excavate the site as long as they were part of it and were not robbed of their findings. Oh yeah, with like a million books made out of gold and silver and priceless artifacts, they're not going to get robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that story is at um, socybertie.com. That's S O C Y B E R T Y dot com. Um, let me see here. There's uh, another item I wanted to cover. I've been meaning to cover this for about a week. This is a uh, project that I have been working on myself for past couple of years, okay? Um, it involves the supposition that at some point there will be draconian rules and regulations put on our beloved internet, wherein you will not be able to get to the websites that you like and enjoy. The internet will be shut down because of social strife, um, aliens coming down in spaceships, uh, giant floods, twisters, what have you. The internet is going to be like shut down and uh, you won't be able to get any to, in, to any websites or anything. However, there is a methodology, uh, a wireless methodology, of being able to replace large parts of the internet using a series of home computers uh, strung together as a wireless ad hoc system. They would use normal IP addresses and everything else. Um, that is one of the avenues of thought that I have been uh, working on myself. Of course, you can't really do anything like that because, well, then you know, all the regulators are going to want to get involved and somebody's going to break into it and blah, blah, blah. So you can't really do anything until after the internet is gone and the only information you have to rely on is what you have stored on your computer. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, what you need to do is when you find an interesting article, an interesting website, in your web browser, you need to click File, Save As, and Save the web page so that it can be used for future reference. Because these days, as information comes out, it is scrubbed from the Internet. We all know it. Um, those of us that are in this uh, community, um, us commentators, I am not a journalist, by the way. I am a commentator. I find the news for you. I give you my comments and thoughts on it. Um, these days, all of us in this community know that you see something on the internet today and it's gone tomorrow, never to be seen again, sucked down into the black hole of censorship. 
So, you find something useful on the internet, save it. Also, what we are doing is we are putting together <coughs> a list of IP addresses. The reason being is that while your um, <coughs> attention was elsewhere, there was a plan afoot in the halls of our beloved United States government to replace the SOPA uh, legislation with a new bill that uh, was kind of snuck in under the big Batman, uh, Batman shooting out there in Aurora, Colorado. So we're putting together a list of IP addresses of websites. Um, when you find a website that's really good, really interesting, um, what you need to do is you need to get the IP address for that website. We are collecting a list of it. Email that to us. Use the contact form and send us the um, IP addresses of interesting websites, articles, pages, that sort of thing. <coughs> because when, if during times of strife, the internet actually is taken down on purpose or by accident, doesn't matter which. And the internet relies on what's called dynamic name servers, DNS servers. And they take the IP address, which is the actual numeric number of that computer that the website exists on. And they take the IP address and convert it into something that you and I can understand. Like, selenetv.com has its own set of numbers. Your website has its own set of numbers. YouTube has its own set of numbers. Google has its own set of numbers. So, what we want to do is we want to collect as many of those numbers as possible so that people can actually refer to those in order to be able to get around on the internet if the dynamic name server system goes down. So if you've got IP addresses, collect IP addresses, use the contact form at selenetv.com and send them to us. Okay, let's go on to another story here. Um, this one is kind of sad. It's sad. It's sick. Um, it's politicizing a tragedy and something that simply should not exist, should not happen. I cannot tell you if it has happened because all I can do is relay to you the information that we have received. This is from The Blaze, theblaze.com and the Associated Press. U.S. military officers accused one of the highest-ranking U.S. commanders in Afghanistan, Lieutenant General William Cal Caldwell, of trying to cover up a horrifying scandal at a taxpayer-funded hospital in Kabul to limit ba bad news in an election year. Colonel Mark Bassel, who testified Tuesday, said he was shocked when Lieutenant General William Cadwell, cited the then upcoming 2010 congressional elections as the reason not to investigate the hospital. And here is the article right here. This is at theblaze.com. Auschwitz-like conditions at this hospital. Um, these military members are accusing the general of attempting to cover this up uh, during the election year. Some of the accusations include starving the patients and surgery with no medications. I don't care who you are, that has got to hurt. Let's um, go here and zoom in on this page so that you can see what I am talking about. Pardon me for one moment. When you're doing a show like this, you need to have refreshments available. Mark Fassel, who testified Tuesday, said he was shocked when Lieutenant General William Cadwell cited the then upcoming 2010 congressional elections as a reason not to investigate the hospital. The general reportedly said at the time, how could we, pause, make this request with elections coming? He calls me Bill. Colonel Fassel said he believed the he in that statement was a reference to President Barack Hussein Obama. Two retired colonels who worked with the training command 
also told the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee that Caldwell did not want an investigation of the Daywood National Military Hospital, and one described the building as having Auschwitz-like conditions. This is in front of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. So don't be coming down on me for reporting this, okay? This is a report that happened in Congress, in the House of Representatives. CNN has a video of the hospital and more, invest, invent, more information on the investigation. Warning, graphic photos. I did not include the photos with this piece because, quite frankly, they are incredibly disturbing. Cadwell is now head of the U.S. Army North Command and Senior Commander of Fort Sam Houston in Texas. North Command spokesman Colonel Wayne Shanks said, I am sure that Lieutenant, that Lieutenant General Cadwell would welcome the opportunity to sp respond to any inquiry, and I'm confident that once the facts are presented and examined, all allegations will be proven false and swept under the rug. I made that last part up. Congressional officials said Cadwell could be called to testify in a future hearing, which means that Congressional officials are going to sweep it under the rug also. Fassel said that Caldwell was visibly upset we had made the DOD request. He added that he retracted the request for an investigation as he was ordered. The colonel said he had expected Cadwell to want immediately to want to immediately visit the hospital and see the conditions. That's what I was expecting and I didn't get, Colonel Fassel said. Representative Jason Chavitz Republican of Utah, who chaired the panel, told the witnesses, it takes commitment and guts for them to testify. He added, this is not over. Want to bet. Chaffis displayed pictures of patients with horrible injuries who were not receiving care from medical personnel. Uh, let's see. Chavitz introduced in September 2011 memo from training command that he described as an attempt to destroy evidence. The memo order destruction or deletion of unofficial audio and video recordings and photos of patients and conditions at the hospital, the smoking gun. There is Colonel Mark Fassel. If this is true, he is a genuine hero. Retired Army Colonel Gerald Carroza, Jr., who is Chief Legal Development assisting the Afghan Army and Defense Ministry, also said Cadwell expressed concern that the request was too close to the 2010 congressional elections. But Carroza added that in his view, Cadwell did not want the request to go to the DOD IG. That would be an inspector's, inspector general's office at the Department of Defense at all. The general did not want bad news to leave his command before the election or after the election. Carrozoa's statement said. If, um, look, personally myself, I don't give a crap how this affects an election. Who gives a flying fart about how this affects an election? If this is true, if there are people in this hospital suffering, if you've ever been in a hospital, you know what it's like. You know what it's like to be laying in a bed with tubes and crap hooked up to you, maybe not be able to move because of an injury. I've been there. I know. To be receiving virtually no care, no painkillers, and no help from the medical personnel is, in my view, worthy of instant damnation for the people involved. I certainly hope it wasn't true. If this is true, somebody, somebody needs to go to jail over this. And not just like for 16 months or 13 months. You're going to the prison. Have a nice day. Let us know how it works out for you. You're not coming out. You're never going to see the light of day again. You're done. Um, it was nice while you were a human being. Unfortunately, you are not a human being anymore. And our... Uh, oh! Okay, hold on just one second. Our uh, browser screen is uh, 
attempting to lock up on us for a second. And there we go. We now have some truly disgusting things. There's a carcass of an animal that has washed up on the shores of uh, New York. Let me see. Uh, the animal was under the Brooklyn Bridge on the Manhattan side of New York, uh, according to the Gothamist uh, blog or newspaper. Our tipster wrote, is this another incarnation of the Montauk monster? You guys want to see this, don't you? You got to see this thing. This is it right here. Ah! <laughs> that is about the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Um, Denise Ginley of um, New York um, photographed this uh, photo, this um, this uh, creature, whatever it is. See right here. Um, it has individual toes. Okay, so uh, I don't think it's a uh, pig by the looks of things. Uh, there's another photograph of it. And another photograph of it. It does kind of sort of look like a pig, doesn't it? But it doesn't have the snout. God only knows what the heck that is sticking out of its mouth. Uh, let's see if we can get in a little bit closer here so that you can... Uh, see this. Uh, it's uh, Denise Grinley over at Flickr. Denise Grinley slash Flickr. Uh, that thing's uh, about the ugliest thing that I've ever seen. Okay. Um, let me see here. Uh, go down here. Okay. Here's how the carcass of the animal, which clearly has had rigor mortis set in, was first described by Gothamist. Our tips to rope, is this another incarnation of the Montauk monster or just the biggest rat in the city? The animal was under the Brooklyn Bridge on the Manhattan side and is maybe two feet a bit more head to tail long. The Montauk monster, in case you haven't heard of it, was similar was a similar occurrence in 2008 of an unknown animal carcass sighted in Montauk, Long Island. Trepiz trep Terrapod Zoology on science blogs reported at the time that the monster was most likely a raccoon that had such an odd appearance given its level of decomposition. So uh, according to this uh, zoology site, here's a uh, picture of the original Montauk monster. Uh, apparently that's a raccoon with a beak. A raccoon with a beak. See the beak there? There is a uh, beak on this thing. Um, yeah, okay, sure. And here's what the uh, latest uh, animal looks like. That's, um, and uh, right about, let's see here, right about here you can see the beak. If you can see my little, um, my little uh, mouse pointer going around there. That's, uh, there you go, that's the, uh, no more news about it. Here's another picture of it. Here it is, uh, relaxing, taking a nap out on the beach there. It's the, uh, uh, I guess we're going to call this the uh, Brooklyn Bridge Monster, the East River Monster. And um, that's uh, about it for that story. That's another one of those. Uh, Gothamist sarcast sarcastically points out that annoying rational people would probably say monsters such as this are just dead bloated animals. If nothing else, as Gothamist reports, a commentator pointed out, the animal could have at least be considered a rodent of unusual size. So there you go. That's uh, the, uh, the new Montauk monster. Um, ugly little bastard, if you ask me. Holy cow. At any rate, let's move on here. Um, here's a, uh, this story is my favorite story of all time. I think this is about the coolest thing in the world. Skydiver. Fearless Felix Baumgartner has done it again. On Wednesday, Baumgartner took another stratospheric leap, this time from an altitude of more than 18 miles. An estimated 96,640 feet, nearly three times higher than cruising jetliners. He landed safely near Roswell, New Mexico. His top speed was an estimated 536 miles per hour. 
It's a second test jump for Baumgartner from such an extreme heights and a personal best. He's aiming for a record-breaking jump from 125,000 feet or 23 miles up. He wants to go super sonic. Here is, um, let me see here if I can uh, find him. No, gosh darn it. I thought I had, um, oh, actually, you know what? We can go here and... The website that, let's see here, the website that uh, Baumgartner is at is called RedBullStratos.com. And you have uh, various pictures of Mr. Baumgartner here. Hold on a second. I'll pick one up in his uh, special skydiving suit. There's Baumgartner getting ready to, uh, getting ready to take off in the uh, helium balloon, the hydrogen balloon, the helium balloon, I guess, uh, ready to take off and uh, and uh, do a skydive from uh, 90 some thousand feet. That's a heck of a thing there. That's uh, really something. Let's uh, take a look at a few more. This is the first time I've actually seen these pictures. Let's take, uh, looks like this is his balloon, the balloon he went up in. Yep, there you go. Uh, ATA Aerospace is uh, the supplier of the balloon for um, Mr. Baumgartner, who is uh, obviously sponsored by Red Bull. It gives you wings. Here's the capsule that he jumped out of right here. It's uh, Baumgartner sits in the capsule before liftoff during the second man test flight for Red Bull Stratos in Roswell, New Mexico. Right there. He's inside of that thing. Holy cow. And it's got his name right on the uh, bottom of the capsule there. So that, um, well, apparently, if uh, anybody finds the capsule, they know who it belongs to. So, anyways, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, our last story for the night, before we uh, call it a night. And, incidentally, I am still researching and following the uh, Sun Doom story that I brought you last night. There is much more information that goes along with this, uh, both from the Boeing whistleblower article as well as the information that has been posted about this, uh, these issues with the sun. We are uh, attempting to get more information, um, and we'll probably have that in a couple of days. So there's no point in me talking about it tonight because it'll just be repeating what I've already told you. Anyways, here in the lovely state of Michigan, shaped like a mitten, we live right about <coughs> there. Anybody that lives in the Detroit area knows exactly what I just did. It's like uh, a secret here in the state of Michigan. Although I think it's supposed to go something like, <coughs> like that. At any rate, Michigan teen starts a hot dog stand to help his disabled parents and is shut down by the city almost immediately. So you're going to say to yourself, the kid just went out and uh, like got himself a cardboard box full of hot dogs and tried to sell them. Oh, contraire. Just how hard is it to start a business in Michigan, this article reads? Nearly impossible, it seems, and believe me, I know, if the recent endeavors of 13-year-old Nathan Dozinski are any indication. I was trying to help my mom and dad because they're both on disability, Dozinski explained, saying that one parent has epilepsy and the other has multiple sclerosis. That's got to be a heck of a thing for a kid to live through, is, uh, is something like that. That's just, that's just so sad. So I was trying to bring in some money for them and the household while they're struggling. We went and we talked with Anna from City Hall on the third floor and she told us that it was fine and we wanted to make sure that so that we stopped in there in person about a month ago and asked her do we need a business permit a license she said no Dzinski's mother Lynette explained Burr said after they had spent roughly one thousand five hundred dollars on the cart on the same day they set it up in a parking lot of a local sporting goods store on private property with the owner's consent they set this up on private property with the business owner's consent just like when you go into the Home Depot 
and there's a hot dog cart set up there at lunchtime or in the local Lowe's or wherever else. The city stopped by to let the 13-year-old year know he was being shut down. Most reports indicate the stand was only up and running for about 10 minutes before the city shut them down. Obviously, here is the cart with the young man right here with his hot dog cart. As you can see, it is not a cardboard box. It is not a little fly-by-night thing. This article, incidentally, is by Erica Ritz. Just how hard is it to start a business in Michigan? Nearly impossible, it seems. <clears throat> um, the story goes on and on and on. However, however, there is good news. Um, a local business in that city by the name of Shoreline Containers <clears throat> stepped in and said, this is wrong. We'll give you $2,500 for your hot dog cart. And they sold him the hot dog cart. The kid doubled his money in like a day. This company is going to use it for their own company um, functions, for uh, company picnics, and for uh, contractors and whatnot. And hopefully the city won't try to shut them down doing that. This article <coughs> also says that commentators have not been able to resist pointing out the irony between the president's recent comment, if you have a business you didn't build that, somebody else made that happen, and how the government really prevented this boy's success. Because there's more to the story. The parking lot of the sporting goods store, private property, with the owner's permission, set up outside of the entrance of the sporting goods store. There are a lot of restaurants in the area, and the restaurants pay a lot of money to the city for certain amenities, including not having hot dog carts and street vendors in the city. So, <clears throat> you can call it uh, greasing the palm, uh, greasing the skids, uh, a little bit of backdoor politicking, um, whatever it is. The kid, his mother, went to the city. The city said, you don't need a permit to do this, obviously, because he had gotten permission from the sporting goods store owner to be on private property doing it. The city said, not a problem parks it in the parking lot, sets it up, and the city comes by and says, you're done. Have a nice day. <clears throat> One has to question whether or not if he had set it up in a different portion of the city, if he would have been allowed to run his hot dog stand. Don't know. <clears throat> Don't care. All I can do is tell you what happened and what my thoughts are on it. And um, I think... <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, that is about it for tonight. Um, let's see. Uh, we're going to cover that one tomorrow night because I want to do a little bit more backgrounding on this. Um, this is about the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation and the NSA whistleblowers that uh, are saying that the uh, government is actually keeping track of virtually every citizen in the country, which would explain why they need that uh, big... Uh, that big facility out there by uh, Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, that was uh, interesting. Um, also, there's uh, the um, Black Mob Violence now has its own um, soundtrack. Somebody has released some uh, music that they can play while they're uh, running rampant all over the uh, country. So they've got that too. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, I do want to tell you about one website that you should be visiting before we go tonight. The website is called spaceweather.com. That's spaceweather.com. They have all sorts of interesting <coughs> solar information. They have a real-time space weather photo gallery. They, uh, over there on the left-hand side of the screen, oops, sorry, over there on the left-hand side of the screen, as you can see, they have uh, the current solar conditions, what's up in space, <coughs> um, 
Let me see here. They got the long range outlook. We're going to be in for a solar storm in between the 28th and 30th. Uh, there's a real time space photo gallery right here. Somebody has taken a picture of the International Space Station with the Progress resupply craft next to it going through space. You have your current uh, auroral oval and you can see that it reaches way, way down in, uh, into the uh, continental United States, uh, southern Indiana at this point. Um, they also have uh, near-Earth asteroids, uh, interesting uh, websites, uh, sunspot summaries. Um, of course, given the article about the sun that uh, we had last night, most of the data is being faked, so that information is going to be useless. Um, geomagnetic storms. What, uh, what kind of uh, forecast do we have for um, M-class flares? 5% chance of an M-class, 1% chance of a X-class. So we're in a quiet period. We have a um, geomagnetic storm possibility of 10% here in the Michigan area, 5% uh, for a minor, and 1% for a uh, severe. So we are looking forward, actually, to possibly seeing the uh, northern lights or the aurora borealis here in Michigan in the near future. Hopefully... Uh, We'll get some video or something like that of it. And as always, we want to remind you at the end of the show to go to SeleneTV.com, become a member, and have some fun, uh, post some stuff, some pictures. We aren't like Facebook. We don't, um, we don't uh, report your comings and goings to the government. And um, that's about it for tonight. Thanks for showing up. My name is Bill Zam. This has been Surrounded by Idiots. And um, hopefully you enjoyed my knittering and nattering and have a good night oh incidentally i believe that our um our friend from mufon is watching tonight so i wanted to uh, make sure that we give him a special message and um and there it is right there ladies and gentlemen have a good evening <laughs>